Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the IIB for our COVID-19 webinar series presented in partnership with our valued associated professional members. Today's session is the fourth of the series, and we're very pleased to have our partners from PwC here to help us explore operational resilience. They'll be focusing on all aspects, but in particular, how U.S. branches and subs of foreign banks approach operational resilience locally and in coordination with their global parent. Our speakers will also talk to us about regu what regulators might expect in terms of lessons learned and how best to prepare for the in inevitable postmortems. Guiding us through the discussion today are Corey Booth, Dan Weiss, and Julian Furioli from PwC. Corey is a partner who leads the technology strategy practice and financial services for PwC and co-leads the agile transformation practice. Um, and Corey has a long history representing financial or consulting for um, financial institutions, including IIB members. So we're lucky indeed to have their expertise available to us today. As a reminder, all participants are muted, but we encourage you to submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom or email them to us at info at iib.org. As per our usual practice, following today's webinar, we will email you all the slides and a link to the recorded session, which will also be available on our YouTube channel in the members only section of our website and Zoom on demand. So thank you again for your time with us today. And Corey, I'll virtually hand the mic over to you. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, great to be here today with you all. Uh, this is a topic that is um, you know, certainly near and dear to our hearts and, and a major part of the agenda that we are um, pursuing with our, with our major clients and financial services, uh, both in terms of, of uh, domestically based institutions as well as, as, well as uh, 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 foreign, um, foreign subsidiaries of, of uh, other institutions. As I think everybody on the phone knows, uh, this is a big topic, it's a, big, it's a current topic. Um, and it is one that is uh, is uh, very much in the news and was very much in the news really even before uh, COVID, of course, uh, but uh, that uh, creates an additional gloss on it. So uh, what uh, I and, and then Julian and Dan uh, would like to do today is to walk you through uh, a few different angles on this topic uh, as a way of, of first laying a, a, a basic foundation for how, how we think about it and how we'd like to talk about it. Uh, but then talking about more specifics and and um, and uh, and more current information based on based on what's happening in COVID and where we think institutions are going to go from here. So uh, let's start with the first part of that, uh, which is really just a just a, a little bit of a backgrounder on what we mean when we say operational resilience. We find that it's a topic that uh, different people uh, in different walks of life and, and in different places in the world and in different institutions can often have somewhat varying interpretations of what it means, how broad it is, um, uh, uh, where it sits in the organization, how banks should, um, should go after it, uh, how regulators are going after it and all that. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time level setting on that first. As a place to get started with that, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd actually like to open a poll question for the group just to get a general demographic sense for um, how this audience sees this topic and, and how much time that they've spent with it in the past. So um, very simply, how familiar are you uh, with, this, with the topic of operational resilience, at least in those terms? Um, and uh, you'll see the options here ranging from not very familiar to, to experts. And if you're experts, then you need to be cautious because I might turn the mic over to you. And I would think, Corey, that if you hadn't been expert, you've become practically so in the last several months. And so it would seem to me to be something that will continue to be of great interest and certainly we're glad today. So you can see uh, from the results that there's a degree of increased familiarity and uh, certainly most folks feel aware and familiar with the nature of the topic. And I guess 
maybe the right answer is to get it and define it because I think everyone has a slightly different view of what operational resilience really means. Absolutely. Well, thanks for your participation with that, and uh, and I'll try to calibrate the discussion accordingly uh, with with the idea that that most of us here have a uh, have a a reasonable sense uh, at least to start with, um, and then we can just uh, uh, spend our time arguing about whether or not we agree with each other rather than uh, than doing the one hundred and one version of this. So what I'd like to start by putting out there is the way we see it. Um, and, and maybe to put a slightly finer point on it um, as a place to start the way that the UK uh, PRA sees it, uh, which, which you know, in our view was probably the regulator that was first out of the box uh, in terms of really upping the bar and, and thinking about the next generation of what this topic means to them uh, and to the UK industry. And then, you know, uh, it, although I don't want to oversimplify it, uh, we see many other jurisdictions, including the U.S., really taking a cue from that in terms of in terms of the way that they think about the topic and the way that they're driving it. But from a U.K. point of view, uh, you'll see the uh, you'll see their uh, preliminary answer to the question at the upper left here. Operational resilience is the ability of firms, FMIs, and the sector as a whole to prevent, respond to, recover, and learn from operational disruptions. There are a lot of important words on that that we'll unpack as we go forward, but, but you know, a couple things to note for now is one is it is, it is sector-wide, um, and two is it represents at least a conception of the entire life cycle of, of what risk looks like in this space and what to do about it from prevention, response, recovery, and, 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 then, uh, and then learning from it in, in order to create a closed loop so that you can be more resilient in the future. That's an important distinction, which, which we'll talk more about as we go, because some people think of it as, as perhaps a more narrow concept of recovery or a more narrow concept of prevention. We see it as a holistic thing, and we think the regulators are heading that way as well. So if you, if you then think about what that means in terms of things that the organization is doing and may be familiar with, other regulations that have preceded it in the past, uh, you'll see other concepts that we think are closely related and, and, and rightly so, business continuity, disaster recovery, cybersecurity, incident and crisis management, all have their roles to play in terms of, in terms of pursuing the goals outlined by the PRA. But we think that most institutions have experienced that um, simply branding it as something like DR or simply branding it as something like BP, BCP, which I think is a, is, is a broader concept than DR, uh, is also not sufficient because we actually see this as a, as a, as a more holistic and more cross-functional um, and a more strategic um, topic that firms have to pursue really, really at the top of the house all the way down. Um, some key aspects of that include protection of critical business services, um, which includes obviously a rich discussion of what do we mean when we say critical business services uh, or important business services or critical business functions. Different regulators in different jurisdictions use different, different terminology to mean approximately the same thing there. And then questions of, well, what do you mean when you say that you need to safeguard that? And you have the UK throwing out terms like impact tolerance, you have the US throwing out terms like maximum tolerable downtime, and these all get to real questions of what do we mean when we say to protect these functions. On the right side of the page, you'll see um, one of our framework, but, but one of many that you could imagine that really uh, talk about the different functional aspects of what goes into resilience. And as you'll see, what this wheel really is representing is not only that life cycle view of all the different kinds of capabilities you need to have in place in order to safeguard the firm, but also a variety of different kinds of risks and a different kinds of scenarios you have to guard against, whether you're talking about a cyber event a, a physical event, a, a technology event, all these things are, are within the scope of what we think that um, organizations need to safeguard against. Obviously, you know, these days we also think about things like pandemics if, in case we weren't already, but obviously we should have been all along. So with that basic foundational concept in mind, then what I'd like to go through is talk a little bit more about how, how we see firms really responding to that as a general, as a general premise. Um, many organizations obviously uh, first um, hear the alarm bells ringing as the result of an incident, um, either either something that is specific to them or or something that is industry wide. So you'll see various kinds of event driven things um, that are that are going on that that can catalyze this conversation. 
we also see systematic reviews taking place. Uh, so for instance, various forms of, of regulatory activity, whether it be horizontal reviews um, or whether it be um, you know, requirements promulgated from the center that, that are, are, are nudging institutions to think about this um, along the lines that I was just talking about. So all of these become um, you know, very important catalysts uh, for, for, for uh, uh, banks and, and other financial services institutions to just really think about, well, where are we? Where do we stand with respect to this topic? Um, and in many cases, really elevating it very, very high on the strategic agenda of, of the institution, um, depending on the level of the event and the level of scrutiny. Obviously, we're all familiar uh, with um, events that hit the headlines. Um, you know, and, and we can uh, probably all think of institutions that we know have experienced very public, very visible um, uh, 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 forms of disruption, whether that be a cyber event or a technology event or, or a fire or a facilities problem, or just a simple problem with, you know, not being able to process a, a particular kind of transaction for a period of time. These are all examples that, that we're, of course, familiar with. But then the question is, what do you do about it? So. What we think about when we think about what it takes to really, really improve uh, uh, the resilience posture um, and the resilience capability of an institution, we think of that as a rather holistic uh, concept. And so, you, and so we typically see firms going through something like the stages of, of, the, of the process that you'll see on the right side here. Not necessarily in perfect order, but, but I think there's a logical sequence to how, how, how they think about it and, and what it means to actually think about it end to end. Starting with governance, who's in charge? What is their mandate? What are the roles and responsibilities that feed into that? And how does that then add up to a holistic answer that allows the, the top management of an organization to effectively lead this topic? Posture and priorities really get into questions of where is our risk? Where are our priorities? How do they impact customers and counterparties and markets? And how, how do we make sure that we're focusing on the right aspects of our business as we safeguard them? There are a lot of related concepts out there. One that we often hear uh, uh, firms talk about is resolution and recovery planning, or RRP. That is another notion where people have often uh, spent time and, and, and invested significant time in terms of thinking through what are the critical parts of the business. But what we find from an operational resilience point of view is that RRP um, uh, and, and resilience speak slightly different languages because, of course, they're dealing with slightly different scenarios. RRP really dealing with, with the resolution of a firm and operational resilience really dealing with the ongoing operations of a firm. Um, so some distinctions yeah. there. And I think there, Corey, just a couple of points that there's been an evolution in thinking, certainly in the States, about how um, different aspects of recovery planning uh, are woven into this notion of, of resilience and, and resolution planning for those institutions that are, are subject to those requirements. And certainly FMU membership requirements and just attention to vendor risk management are another permutations of the kind of thinking you just summarized are ones in which there's an expectation that the connections that you have both externally and within your group are very important. And I think very likely institutions that are global in nature with tendrils both operationally in the United States, but also in head office, uh, that has to resonate. And so these kinds of of considerations, both in terms of the practical uh, relative to involving yourselves in tabletops or uh, considering the pressure testing and certainly the reality of the pandemic has been doing that, as you said earlier, but this notion of what can you do and what are the expectations given the different constituencies are certainly on the mind of the regulators. Thanks, Dan, absolutely. So as firms get those basics in place, then they have to figure out what to do about it, which obviously leads to remediation. What do we need to fix? And testing, how do we know that we fixed it? And how do we ensure that we actually are building those capabilities over time um, as a result of t testing things, perhaps failing things, finding out what to improve, and then doing it all over again? Which leads to the final concept of sustainability. I mean, one of the most important things that we that we tell our clients early on is that the regulators and you as clients should not be looking for quick fixes to this problem. This is an ongoing capability that you need to build over time. 
and it and chances are, it, uh, you know, we 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 see we we think that in general, if the regulators see someone essentially treating this as a band aid, essentially treating this as a quick fix, then they will look skeptically on that because they think that these are fairly large, uh, difficult to resolve problems in the way the institutions operate, and they take solutions that develop over time uh, and secure the institutions over time. So. Um, the, another way that we think about this and, and the way that we that we pose um, uh, some of our early advice to clients is really thinking about well, what are the what are the key factors to success? What do people really need to be putting in place that they probably don't have uh, that will give them an early leg up uh, in terms of tackling this problem? And, and we boil that down really uh, to the six things you see on this page, which we think are, are the things that that institutions are really focusing most on um, as they think through their 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 agendas integrated executive accountability, trying to figure out what that first line and second line leadership really looks like that are leading this topic. Metrics, which allow that leadership to communicate and, and manage throughout the organization and explain to the board and to the senior management team how they're doing against this. It's a very difficult topic um, because uh, we're, you know, based on the breadth that we're talking about. And, and I, well, I, I would say that no one exactly has the right answer. There's been a lot of work done on this in the last year with some interesting results. Uh, critical services, obviously working through that map um, and understanding how the business layers, the operations layers, the technology layers, the data layers all interact in order to provide those critical services into the market um, and therefore how to safeguard it at all levels. Corollary to that, of course, are the technical aspects, which really often are, are the place where the conversation starts, especially if it's a technical or cyber issue, obviously. But getting that architecture in place, getting those standards in place, understanding what resilience really looks like for a system and whether or not you're compliant with those standards. Uh, and then, and then um, also just really thinking through a lot of the fundamental hygiene and operational aspects of, of how you actually go about securing an IT environment. Are your patches up to date? Are you doing your disaster recovery testing? Are you backing up data? Are you executing um, um, IT service management in such a way that allows you to respond to incidents? And a lot of stuff that technical people uh, worry a lot about, but may, but may in fact um, you know, not, be, not be as proficient in practice as they might like. And then finally, on the operating model side, just really thinking through, well, what does this mean for the way that I operate as a business? Do I have the right sourcing decisions in place? Do I have the right location decisions in place? Do I actually understand how, how my activities come together in order to provide the services? And can I provide a view on that to, to the senior management? Are all big questions. As we go and we talk to various institutions about how they're doing against those elements, we actually see wide degrees of variance. Um, so you'll see here a, a disguised example of, of the way that we see various institutions. Um, and by the way, these, these are in general large global institutions that are among the most sophisticated players in the global financial services industry. And even in that crowd, we see significant differences in terms of how mature they are. In general, uh, what you'll see, at least amongst this set, is people have done a decent job of investing in some of those technology aspects, at least at, least, uh, at, least at the first uh, order of approximation. But they may be slower um, on the uptake in terms of things like metrics and the operating model, and even in some cases, figuring out what the executive accountability structure and leadership structure look like. So we do see a lot of these sorts of variances and needless to say, so do regulators as they, as they do their reviews um, and, and look across the industry. So um, taking a quick pause here, I'd like to um, re-engage you and I'd like to then uh, tee up a little bit of a conversation that's, that's more specifically focused on how to think about these questions of, of both the, the global scope of resilience as well as what it means for local, local organizations uh, such as the ones that, that most of you represent. So as a place to start, I'd like to ask this poll question. How does your firm handle operational resilience for the local market? And, how, and, and also, how does that really tie into how you're organized from an operational aspect? Are you more centralized? Are you less centralized? Are your operations distinct within, within the country or, the, or they tend to be part of a global operating model? And would appreciate your answers on this. And Corey, I think that this has a fairly high impact in terms of where you think you are because in a local market, you have potentially a lot of responsibility and accountability, but not necessarily authority over some of the key areas that, you know, could be stressed when you have a pandemic or something else like it. So I can appreciate that where you sit and how you're structured can impact how you think about operational resilience and what you can do it in your role. 
Absolutely, well said. And and I think that the the poll data is is a very you know interesting case in point of that. I mean, we've got almost a normal distribution here in terms of how how these organizations work and how and how each of your roles work. And what that means is there are a lot of nuanced conversations to be had around well, what does that really mean? Um, in some cases, you'll have um, you know a, a, a relatively lower level of conflict between those questions of authority and autonomy and and, and interdependency that Dan is raising, um, uh, uh, but but not necessarily easy answers in any case. But um, but let's let's keep that in mind as we go forward. And then I'd appreciate any questions and answers uh, via the um, or, or any questions from from the, from the group uh, via the uh, the Zoom tool there uh, that we can that we can use in order to illustrate some of those differences and and uh, and get into more details along the way as you see fit. So as a way of of talking a bit about this, you know. <sighs> There, as, as the poll indicates, there are not necessarily hard and fast rules about how exactly to orchestrate this uh, and uh, what, what local responsibilities really mean and how they need to interact with their, with their global partners in order to ensure operational resilience, both at the global level as well as, as, well as at the local level, and satisfying the various um, regulatory regimes that exist along that spectrum as well. But some general rules of thumb we find often fall against these four categories that you see on this page, uh, it, governing the home office versus local interactions. First, governance and accountability, just really understanding um, in, in explicit terms what that means, what, what that integrated structure looks like at the top, how it cascades to local organizations, um, and the responsibility of local executives and boards to ensure for resiliency within their area. Those are responsibilities that, that obviously regulators are looking for for individuals within local markets to have. Uh, and what we often find, I mean, I'm, I think about a client that I'm that I've been working with recently on this topic. Uh, the the local management, at least in some countries, was relatively in the dark. Um, about all of the things that were really being done on this topic, which were in fact quite significant, but there was not necessarily a systematic structure in place in order to be able to ensure the right kind of information flow and to ensure the right kind of contribution uh, to the decision-making structure um, at both global and local levels. And getting that sorted out is obviously is obviously critical, not just for peace of mind, but also for uh, uh, what, what regulators are looking for. Um, Actually, um, one question that that has uh, that has come up that I might as well answer here while we're talking about governance and accountability is the question of how common is the role of a chief resiliency officer? Where does that role sit in the organization, and and and, and does that role report to executives versus boards, um, uh, et cetera? And you know, I, I there are a variety of just this is a topic that we could unpack at great length. Uh, but 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 uh, the short answer is we see while we do see a few different models evolving, the idea that that position exists is first of all a big realization in itself because that is not that is not necessarily something that always, that that has existed or even today exists in all companies um, uh, that it is typically senior role um, it is typically um, uh, we, we recommend typically that it comes out of someone from an operations background um, who who is also familiar with technology and risk Although you do see people coming out of any of those disciplines or others, uh, but but uh, we see in many cases the most successful models is really being uh, sort of attached to a COO kind of kind of profile or a COO kind of organizational construct. And you know while reporting ro roles and reporting relationships can can vary depending on the way organizations work, obviously the person needs to be close enough to the top with enough of an ability to provide an independent perspective on what's going on, that they can execute their role um, and, and execute their, their, their accountabilities as needed. Um, but it's a very important great. topic to, that, that companies really need to start with as they start down this road. Yeah, I know that some of the questions I've been hearing with a role like this is, and this would be true of an internal auditor, or you know, is this role able to reach across different functional responsible units and be able to influence and involve those units in the resiliency process. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you need to have enough stature in the role to be able to be impactful. And I think the other element that you raise on page 10, which to me is a, a very helpful summary and one can use across the dynamic states that you know the poll indicated that there could be standalone 
operations that a local office or uh, network can in fact be responsible for. And then it could be that some of that local activity supports the rest of the global network. And so the responsibility across can be dynamic and you'll probably want to have a local responsible officer and someone maybe on a global basis really driven based on the structure that the poll sort of showed. So if you're decentralized, you need to have maybe a center of excellence, a driver of policy and proceed collecting of key elements and connecting the dots. Whereas if you have centers, and I know a lot of firms have considered, for example, shared service platforms across the globe, maybe in a couple of key financial centers. And how does that impact in terms of all the dimensions that you have on this page? Yes, absolutely. The, yeah, and, and, and touching on many of the points that you just made, I, I mean, other aspects that are, that are shown here are, are questions of how you really create that sort of integrated, interwoven fabric between local and, local and global requirements in the risk and regulatory world, uh, making sure that people understand those varying requirements um, and understand how they feed into the global program and back down. Uh, same for program management. Um, in the example that I was talking about earlier, in many cases, the question of what work streams and initiatives were really underway in order to safeguard the institution were not widely known enough. Um, and, and, so they, and so they needed to really upgrade their ability to create transparency across the entire portfolio of resilience activities. And then reporting on metrics, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, trying to create a, a way by which both the local supervisory boards and individuals, um, as well as as well as the, the global entity, really have a, a single, unified, consistent understanding of, of what resiliency really means to them. So that's where I'd like to um, um, leave off with the overall discussion of resilience. Um, uh, again, really just to level set everyone on how we think about it and how we think about some of the evolving roles and responsibilities and requirements and priorities uh, that institutions face. And with that in mind, uh, then I'd like to proceed and, and, and talk about, about uh, COVID um, and, and what the last few months have taught us and where we see that going from here. Um, I will, I, I, I need to spend very little time on this page, um, which is obviously meant to be to explain that COVID is a big deal. Um, I think that anybody alive in the world today um, understands that. Uh, but uh, in terms of thinking about it within the financial sector, uh, in the US financial sector more specifically, a few interesting statistics to share um, just as a way of grounding the conversation. Um, uh, on the left side, uh, you know, you can you can see that the financial sector has suffered, um, at least as of the date shown here, which was we pulled this data in mid-May a couple of weeks ago, uh, had suffered more than than the markets as a whole, uh, presumably due to the balance sheet and liquidity effects that institutions have been experiencing. Uh, and we've also seen some pretty dramatic activity in terms of the way that institutions have really had to think through in real time or near real time, what they do in terms of essential services, how those, how those services need to be provided, how to make sure that they and their clients are able to maintain their balance sheets. So um, on the right side, you'll see some statistics from the retail sector, which I know may not represent everyone on this call here, uh, but uh, we saw significant um, um, uh, uh, triaging of, of branch activity and of distribution activity uh, in terms of the way that consumers were being served by these institutions, both nationally, as you'll see in this pie chart, as well as at the lower half of the page, um, some geospatial analysis that we did uh, that, that focuses specifically on Manhattan, Manhattan as an example, and the idea that, that uh, um, uh, while banking services are considered an essential services and need to continue, the question of how that gets provided to the market at the consumer level um, was something that was very much in flux um, during this crisis and something that we see is continuing to be in flux even as people stabilize more. Um, now, there are obviously now analogs to this as we think about wholesale markets and, and, and corporate markets in terms of continuing to provide services at that level. In general, that's been perhaps a little less geospatially challenging uh, because many of the people involved are able to uh, be a little bit more flexible in terms of where they work and whatnot, uh, but obviously uh, significant impacts that all of you have no doubt felt. Um, 
so the question is, what, what does this mean for us as we think about it from a resilience lens? There are obviously lots of different lenses that you can look at um, in, in thinking about COVID, and, and this series is an example of that. But, but for purposes of today, let's think about it really from two lenses. Um, and, and with the overall idea that, 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 that we have that, that COVID has represented in many ways an acid test for operational resilience capabilities, at least of a certain flavor, and certainly given both institutions and regulators plenty to think about as they think through the other scenarios um, on, their, on their resilience uh, plate. Two main questions uh, you'll see on the left side. Uh, the first question, how effective is our resilience program? Did we really know what we knew? Did we really um, have what we thought we had in terms of being able to offer the right level of resilience to the organization during an incident like this? And then secondly, do we have a resilient operating model? That really gets to a broader set of questions outside, um, at least nominally, the scope of, of what a resilience organization or a resilience function would need to consider, but certainly something that an institution as whole needs to consider. Were our operations, were our activities um, uh, sufficiently robust in order to work through this crisis um, and, and ensure that we can continue to provide those services? And are there bigger changes that we need to make as we move into what some of my colleagues are now calling the new abnormal? So thinking about the first question, how effective is our resilience program? Um, I, I think we could all sell plenty of war stories about this. Um, I think that uh, every institution is, is, has been thinking through this for, for a few months now. But just as an example, three things that we see as being reasonably common across institutions that we've spoken to are, are some of the challenges you'll see on this page with critical business functions and services. Um, you know, this, this was not the sort of crisis where, where it was about an outage, of course. Um, I mean, that may have been a secondary thing, but it was not the case that a data center was out or, or, or a database was held hostage to ransomware or something like that. It was not that sort of an availability challenge, but it was the sort of thing where um, institutions needed to think through how to ensure that they were able to transition their workforce, transition their activities, uh, transition customer needs throughout a, a several week period so that those services could continue to be offered in a, in a robust sort of way. That was not just an internal problem, it also had to do with third party and counterparty risk and running into problems there. So for instance, uh, we saw cases where institutions found that they had vulnerabilities there that they hadn't really thought about, which in some cases they would, they were sort of, they, they may have said, well, that would, we clearly should have thought about that. Uh, shame on us, but in other cases, it was a bit of a surprise. An example of that being being um, uh, an example of credit card statements, uh, which which is what I refer to here about dependence on a single processing or print facility. A very large institution found that it was really dependent primarily on one print third party printing facility in order to get those statements out. And when those printers could no longer go to work in that building, there was not an obvious way by which those statements could go out, which meant that there was not an obvious way that they could guarantee the customers could see their bills. And, and you can imagine the problems that ensue from there. So finding those sorts of points of failure in the system that, well, for better or for worse, this, this shone a light on those sorts of things. Incident response is another interesting capability that, that is obviously core to what it takes to make an institution resilient, being able to actually know what to do in the cases of, of, a, of, a, of an issue and who takes charge of what decisions and how those decisions percolate through the organization. This was a slow moving crisis. So it wasn't the case where you had to get all those decisions right in the next two hours. But it was the sort of case where the same people that needed to make the decisions in this case would likely be the same sort of people that would need to make decisions in other scenarios. And so therefore, it's an opportunity for institutions to really think about who needed to be in the room in order to make these calls, what kind of information did they need in order to be able to make those calls, and what lessons can we learn from there. And Corey, just, just sort of a point that I realized it may extend, but shows the connective tissue. You know, during this period, a lot of banks, including foreign banking groups in the U.S., found that their liquidity planning to be really uh, fully used and stressed. And so they're rethinking, you know, the the liquidity levers that they have, and some of those levers include getting good data with a dynamic environment, and so being able to get relevant information and then having the decision makers and the data users all have an ability to look at that information and 
be responsive and use the levers that are available to the best possible use and communicating effectively with counterparties and FMUs and central banks. Those are things that really are enable, for example, a CFP to work. And so right. that's the issue that I guess I call out. And it would not surprise me, and we'll get to this in terms of lessons learned, that making sure that the people who manage the liquidity for the group have the resources needed to execute their work well is really important. Yes. So with that, um, let me uh, turn to answer the other question. Um, and, and, and this really paints the way towards a broader set of considerations that may come up as institutions really, really continue to digest and metabolize the lessons learned from, from, from COVID. Um, I've mentioned a few of them before, location and sourcing strategy. Do we really know what our third parties are doing? Do we really know how, that, how they will work or will not work in the case of a crisis? Um, you know, we saw, we saw instances where, say, you know, offshore uh, technology providers or operations providers were knocked offline because their employees couldn't work from home in the same sorts of ways that we might be accustomed to in the States. That's something I think, um, uh, obviously, all of you represent global institutions who may have experienced these sorts of issues, and they're, and they're probably not foreign to you at all. Um, but thinking through some of those failover situations uh, from a technology and an operations point of view, um, how to think through the capacity and skilling needed in order to make sure that you could be resilient in the case of disruptions to those facilities is something that has really given a lot of people pause. Um, similarly, questions of automation and digitization of those processes and really thinking through, well, you know, if we don't have a place where paper can come and paper can go, what do we do about it? And how do we think about how uh, scenarios where if we can virtualize more of those operations, then we actually gain additional flexibility and additional resiliency um, and robustness in terms of how we can reconfigure and relocate those processes as needed. Uh, and then finally, from a risk and control lens, a lot of the same sorts of issues uh, both, both came up in terms of challenges as well as opportunities to rethink how things are done uh, in terms of things like um, signatures and other forms of, of, of controls uh, that may be in place that were, that were of course, significantly challenged. Um, examples of that that everybody faced almost uh, were cases of how to think about how to provision remote access for employees um, at scale um, with devices that may or may not be owned by the company. Uh, some companies thought through that sort of thing very well and others found them thinking through it for the first time. Uh, but those are the sorts of those are the sorts of things that that are that are naturally going to come up as as companies examine, uh, well, learn learn the lessons they learned over the last few months, obviously, but then examine what other issues they're going to run across in the coming months and years. Um, so so that's how institutions are, we think are 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 really sort of beginning to be introspective about some of these lessons learned. Um, obviously, the regulators have their own take, um, and they, they've, you know, sort of been talking about it really since, since the things started to hit and since they started issuing additional guidance. Um, on this page are some examples of some of the guidance that came down uh, from uh, within the U.S. as well as other institutions around, around how they thought about uh, some of the initial safeguards that need to be in place. Um, but also pointed the way towards what they saw as longer term sorts of resilience capabilities uh, that they were going to be looking for in institutions. And while, uh, um, you know, some of this, in my opinion, was Monday morning quarterbacking saying, well, you should have had all these things in place, uh, it still has obvious implications for how, um, uh, how responses need to happen going forward as regulators begin to ask these questions in more systematic ways. So, what were your plans? What were your scenarios? Did you think about the cyber implications of what you were doing? Are you protecting consumers uh, from, from potential sources of fraud and financial crime um, based on some of these operational disruptions and the idea that they're consuming services in different sorts of ways? These were all um, important topics to the regulators that we see coming up again and again. And in some cases, um, in most cases, actually challenging the way that resilience programs need to think about them as well. Um, so, so that's sort of a, a snapshot of how we see um, COVID, um, at least going back in time. Now, what we'd like to do is go a little bit forward in time um, and talk about where we see institutions going from here. In part, what we see that involving is going to be, of course, uh, just making sure that lessons are learned and that, and that um, companies and individuals who, who are in positions of authority are reflecting on what they've learned now that we've reached 
what is arguably a more stable point in the uh, in the pandemic uh, and and an opportunity for for really pausing and reflecting on that um, so this is a model for the kind of post-mortem activity that we see um, companies starting to undergo um, and there there are various levels of thinking about this in some cases they're just starting to think about what this might look like in other cases they're well on the way towards executing it but we see a, a, um, an opportunity for banks to really take a structured look, a systematic look at what worked, what didn't uh, with respect to the operations and with respect to the processes. Um, so, um, uh, so thinking about the overall response model in terms of strategy and governance and what that really means for the institution, uh, thinking about it from a functional aspect. How did the resiliency program play into the overall response? What about technology? What about cybersecurity? Uh, what about HR, which was obviously a critical issue in terms of safeguarding the, the workforce um, a, a, as they began to undergo this transition and will continue to be a major source of concern for the coming months. And then as Dan pointed out, a ton of issues associated with financial management, trying to make sure that that liquidity and credit risk and all these other things were properly considered as banks reconfigured their operations really in real time. On the right side of the page, thinking about the specific aspects for various operational units and various commercial units and, and how the, the overall decisions that the institution was, was facing cascaded down uh, into those organizations that had specific issues to contend with. And then, of course, cascaded back up as the institution put together its overall picture. So we see um, an opportunity for organizations really to take a holistic look across this, as I said. And, and think through what, what this means, not just for the resilience program, but really for the, for the, for the bank more broadly in terms of providing um, a, a additional wisdom, both for the next phase of the pandemic, return to work um, and, and the new abnormal, as well as thinking about what it can mean to shore up resilience more generally. So keeping that picture in mind, I'd like to turn back to you again um, and understand whether or not uh, we're right about this, understanding whether you see a movement within, within your firms uh, to really take, conduct that sort of a postmortem and really to take that sort of a look back, uh, or is that too early yet? I really wish we had a different phrase from postmortem, because in this environment, that may be a bad taste. But True. I think for those that... Um, uh, are thinking about what are the implications. I think there's probably tactical as well as strategic. And imagination is that it all ties into some of the building block approach you've been summarizing, Corey. Um, but I'd be interested to see what where people are in this process. Are they just living it? Are they beginning to think about not only return to the abnormal, the new abnormal, as you were saying, or is there something more that we got to just address because it didn't work for us during the most recent couple of months. Yes. All right, another fairly normal distribution um, with uh, with uh, most firms. Uh, I guess I guess the uh, the uh, most common answer being underwear will start soon, uh, but uh, but some shoulders off of that as well. So probably good timing to have this conversation. I'm glad we're having it. Um, so what I'd like to do then is just is just to close the the um, the, um, uh, the the formal part of this presentation on this note, which is just really thinking a little bit more broadly and thinking about well, once you conduct that 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 um, that after action report um, to stay away from the postmortem term. Um, and, and think through those lessons for the institution as a whole, as well as for the resilience function. Um, then we get to the question of, well, what is this really going to mean? What is, what is going to be different about banking? What is going to be different about the functions within banking, operations, technology, resilience, risk, what have you, um, uh, uh, based on those lessons learned? And, you know, while none of us have crystal balls, uh, we think that the 10 things listed on this page will have something to do with the answers to these questions, whether it be from an operational standpoint, a technology standpoint, or, or, or really more broadly ways of working. On the operations side, um, we certainly see you know, the obverse of most of the challenges that I had on the previous pages in terms of thinking through what operational redundancy really looks like, how to safeguard third party risk. Um, how to make sure that you don't have manual process flows that actually create risk um, uh, as opposed to dispelling it. 
um, how to think through what the implications are for how you actually organize it a broader picture across units, across across geographies, across products, across across legal entities, and across distribution channels, um, and really thinking through how you can continue to drive efficiency, which has really, of course, been the, the watchword for most of the action in the operation space over the last um, many years, but then also really thinking through how to how to counterbalance that against some of the risks that that efficiency may in fact create if we don't do it carefully. On the technology side, um, you know, we think that there are ways of safeguarding uh, those sorts of single points of failure as well um, through better architecture, through better management of data, uh, through fewer dependencies on physical infrastructure uh, that, that may go down. Um, and through obviously continuing to um, be smarter and smarter and smarter over time uh, in terms of safeguarding things like cybersecurity uh, risk um, and, and what that means for the institution. Then in terms of, of ways of working, which is a broad topic, but really just thinking through, well, how do, how do organizations work and what are the behaviors of employees um, uh, as they interact with each other? Uh, we think um, that, uh, you know, there will be more remote work going forward. Um, you know, that's that's certainly the conventional wisdom that the idea that everybody's going to go back to the office anytime real soon uh, is is not likely to happen, at least in the numbers that we saw before. Um, but that that need not impede uh, the ability for people working closely together. Um, the idea that folks like us, for instance, can collaborate with you in an online setting like this is something that wasn't always a norm before, and now it is. And we think that over the, over the medium term or so, that will likely be a net benefit for organizations in terms of their ability to work more agilely, work more cross-functionally, work, work more across geographies, and bring institutions closer together and be able to operate more flexibly. Um, and so all of these things we think are, are themes that, that institutions can explore as they, as they paint the way forward. So that is it, that is the end of the slides. We've had a number of questions coming in, which, which I think we can turn to now. And to the extent that you have more to ask, we'd be happy to try to address them in the time that we have remaining. So I, I think we should start because we do have a couple of them. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe I can raise them and let's just chat through them, not in any particular order. Uh, do we expect, based on what we've seen so far, dramatic changes at institutions following the pandemic, or do we think there'll be more tweaks and adjustments? Yeah, I mean, from, from, from my standpoint, I think that uh, there will be moments of reckoning along many of the dimensions that we've talked about here um, that will generate significant changes. I think that at least, at least if I think about it narrowly from a resilience point of view, I think that was true before. Um, many of the larger institutions that, that we're familiar with um, have really found themselves um, significantly reorienting their priorities and significantly reorienting their investment budgets in order to fix resiliency problems in general anyway. Uh, so, for instance, I, uh, you know, institutions have run into significant technology problems that require significant investment. Um, we've had institutions say, you know what, all, all the stuff that we would like to do in order, in order to drive our commercial agenda farther um, uh, this year, we, we, we are going to need to deprioritize those in order to shore up some of the basics of, of technology and operational and cyber resilience. I think that was a trend before this. Going forward, um, I, 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 while this is not necessarily exactly the same sort of flavor of question, um, the idea of being able to shore up institutions and make them more resilient against this sort of a scenario is it, simply going to drive a lot of thinking. Now, a cynic would say that that is, um, you know, sort of another example of Monday morning quarterbacking. Um, but, but I think a more realistic um, way of looking at it is, is these are institutions that will need to change the way that they work and as a result are going to need to go through a very thorough process of understanding what that new way of working is in order to make sure that it is effective and, and efficient and, and resilient as it needs to be. And I, I know that you can frame this a number of different ways. One is, does it accelerate some of the strategic change that a number of institutions moving into a sort of more digitized, different channels, both in terms of the client experience, customer experience, but also in the way work is being done at different 
banking organizations. And so that could accelerate some of those choices and sort of the balance between what is the cost of doing that versus the sustainability that doing that sooner than later might represent. So there's sort of a cost-benefit analysis, but then there's also a resiliency uh, dimension that may need to be valued in some fashion that hasn't necessarily been factored in to pure financial returns. Absolutely. Never let a crisis go to waste um, in some ways, uh, but but uh, that, that again is perhaps not the best way to put it. Fair, fair point. Um, another couple of questions. One is, you know, we're talking about pandemic, which certainly hit everyone pretty quickly. Um, what about slower moving challenges, such as climate change or, or other kinds of demographic changes that might be viewed as critical or, or, or even existential to a bank or banking? Mm -hmm. Well, those are, those are, um, those are those are the sorts of topics that that ultimately end up being, at least in my opinion, even more important by perhaps orders of magnitude than anything we're talking about today. Um, I think the good news uh, is that um, forward-thinking institutions will will have already said, well, these are these are <laughs> these are well-known, although very complex factors, uh, and should be part of our strategic planning process. In any case, I think in many ways that's the right place for them. Uh, because these really are sort of the, the kinds of things that, that um, uh, although not as slow moving as we might like, are, are nevertheless slow moving enough that they can be accommodated within, within planning cycles. Where should our institutions be? Where should our locations be? What sorts of products do we need to offer? Um, you know, what do we think demographic change will bring in terms of people's interest and willingness to consume financial services and what their needs and risks are. These are these are the types of questions which, as you say, are existential. They shape the way that we think about not just inst products, but institutions entirely and the sector entirely, uh, and, and probably need to be considered at that level. That said, um, uh, for things that could happen quickly, um, if I were if I were a resiliency officer, I would absolutely be considering the possibility of discontinuous climate effects uh, in 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 many scenarios that I might consider, whether that be hurricanes, whether that be uh, rapid rises in sea levels due to icebergs calving off of Antarctica, um, what have you. Th those are the sorts of scenarios which are sitting squarely re within resilience. And, and I can sort of imagine that um, things like where do you locate your primary and backup servers or other electronics? Putting it in a basement probably doesn't make any sense if you're potentially at risk from a water table standpoint, right? It um, might be a bad idea in any case. Indeed, in fact. You know, how, I know a lot of firms have been wrestling with this notion of how much of the cloud do I use? And, what does it represent? Because I might solve one problem, but then I introduce others in terms of cybersecurity. And I imagine that's where that dialogue is terribly important in terms of framing sort of the needs and the concerns, and then the costs, obviously, of the alternatives. But do you see that as the responsibility of chief operating officer, the different constituents that might end up being in the role of a chief resiliency officer. How does one sort of set up that for a constructive dialogue to inform some of the longer term planning that the organization has? And what's the right cadence of that? Well, those, well you know, those, well, from a, from a cadence point of view, I could, I could argue that there's nothing like, there's not, there's nothing like too soon here. Um, and uh, and it's certainly the sort of thing where having these sorts of dialogues frequently is pretty important and making sure that the right voices are in the room. So for instance, uh, you know, just picking on one of the topics you mentioned, cloud, um, you'll see significant, you'll see differences of opinion out there in the industry about whether, whether um, migrating workloads to cloud, migrating the architectures to cloud is actually introducing uh, resiliency or, or subtracting resiliency. Um, I could argue that one either way if I were in a debating society. 
the point is not whether uh, it is one way or the other. The point is that it's a change to the topology of the firm um, and therefore needs to be evaluated appropriately with respect to new scenarios and new risks that may emerge and how those risks can be controlled as well as the risks that may be foregone or, or investments that may be avoided as a result of, for instance, not having to harden your data center in the same way. Makes sense. I've got another question that maybe I'll just pose, and I think it's one that is reading tea leaves as much as anything else, and that is, what do we think is the most important thing that institutions will need to demonstrate for, for, the, for the regulators when they do a post-mortem review? So let me actually flip back to this slide as a way of teeing that up, uh, because uh, again, I think this is something where you know different different people may have different opinions. Um, I, I I believe that um, there will be questions asked at multiple levels. Um, we typically find um, that regulators really want to start at the top of the house. Um, and really want to understand questions of governance, questions of accountability, questions of decision making, questions of the evidence behind that decision making, in order to really understand um, whether or not the decision making process were, were were in place and whether those represented, um, you know, documented norms versus versus ad hoc improvisation. Um, Beyond that, um, I, we, we expect that um, they will ask a variety of questions depending on what they see, of course, um, but with a particular focus on things like consumer harm, um, institutional and market harm uh, with respect to things like liquidity, solvency, credit risk, and so forth, and how those issues were managed. Um, uh, but, then, but then after that, beginning to ask additional questions around things like how was cyber risk controlled, how was financial crime risk controlled, um, and the rest of the gamut. So we see it being a rather holistic set of topics um, that, will be, that will be ripe for exploration by regulators. So it's not just one thing, but it may be one thing that will be prominent depending on the institution. Uh, and how they've been responding so, so far. That's probably the best way to answer the question right now. But certainly anything the firm does itself to sort of ferret out what worked well, what didn't, where are the pain points um, from a resiliency as it's defined at the institution. To me, that's a way to guide the dialogue with the regulators. I mean, I think you had an earlier slide that highlighted uh, from the FFIC guidance, what they may be looking for as a starting point, which is a lot more uh, infrastructure driven. Um, but I'd say uh, just in my own dialogue with the agencies, you know, there has been a lot of attention to financial resiliency and managing around the liquidity planning uh, obviously, with the some of the programs that the agencies have introduced, now how will the institutions manage some of the credit risks that will be emerging and the delay recognition of some of those challenges, and the infrastructure to sort of facilitate all of that as you're bringing people back into sort of the no, their normal workload. Those are all elements that I know regulators have had informal conversations at the largest firms where there is a resident supervisor, small r, in the sense that they may be virtual, have been virtual as well. But, you know, I, this hour is just absolutely flown, Corey, and I don't know if Bridget uh, uh, would like to rejoin us, but uh, it's something that, you know, is a topic that probably deserves continued attention for every firm, and this is a to your point, Corey, seize the moment and make sure that you have the tools you need to continue preparing for the next big uh, operational resilience challenge. Yeah. Indeed, and thank you all. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Corey. Really great slides, great presentation. And, you know, this slide this up, I think it's, it's always really, um, interesting for our members to sort of see the different approaches or emphasis, you know, with uh, different home regulators. And also, Dan, I think that's really, it was really valuable, your observations about, you know, what the, at least the U.S. regulators are really focusing on here. 
liquidity, sort of the unfolding credit risk, right, as the programs sort of peel off, what's the plan? Um, and then these questions about the infrastructure to um, analyze all that. And we've also heard from members that, you know, there's an expectation around much more kind of real-time reporting and monitoring, and we would expect you know, that to continue as well. So anyway, thank you. This was a really valuable hour. We appreciate it. And uh, again, members uh, look for an email with these resources. And of course, um, we, we probably are gonna need a round two down the road. So we'll, we'll be looking to you for some help on that. I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Stay well, stay safe. And uh, we look forward to meeting again uh, soon. Thanks.